So what I'll be speaking about today uh, will focus on the content of my book, uh, Extraterrestrial, whose cover you can see in the middle of this uh, slide. And if I had to summarize it in one sentence, I would say, when you are not ready to find exceptional things, you will never discover them. Last year, I also wrote uh, another book, a textbook that you can see on the right side, titled Life in the Cosmos. And it's a more than a thousand pages long. It provides the scientific background for this new frontier of exploration. What you see on the left side is a photograph of a picture that was hung on the walls of the Berlin Brandenburg Academy of Science and Humanities last October. And it shows an image that was taken at my office by the German photographer, Herlinde Quilbel, who asked me to write on the palm of my hand the question that I regard as most important in science. And I wrote, are we alone? And of course, by now we know that we are not unique or special or privileged because half of the sun-like stars have a planet roughly the size of the Earth and roughly at the same separation from the host star. And that means that our environment is not unique. There are more habitable Earths in the observable volume of the universe than there are grains of sand on all beaches on Earth. And so that teaches us a sense of modesty. And if you see a picture like the one in the middle of this slide of an emperor or a king being very proud of themselves, uh, after conquering a small piece of land, that should not be too impressive because it resembles an ant hugging a single grain of sand on the landscape of a huge beach. But I can understand where it's coming from, this sense of pride and arrogance and uh, privilege, because when I watched my daughters as they were very young, they tended to think that they are the smartest in the world until I took them to the kindergarten and they got a better perspective. And so our civilization will mature by finding others. We tend to think that Albert Einstein was the smartest scientist that ever lived, but that is unlikely uh, because 13.8 billion years passed since the Big Bang and there could have been a scientist smarter than Albert Einstein that lived a billion years ago on a planet around another star. And such a scientist would have been part of a civilization that could have sent probes throughout the Milky Way galaxy. And these probes would have reached us by now over a billion years. So are we living in such a reality? The only way to find out is to look up. And we know that most stars form billions of years before the sun, so that is quite possible that uh, someone predated us, a smarter kid on our cosmic block. And we are unlikely to meet a biological creature near us. Most likely, uh, we will meet an artificial intelligence system because such a system can survive the long journey between stars. And it, it could behave autonomously without needing the senders to give it instructions, the way we give the Perseverance rover on the surface of Mars. So the future is with AI astronauts and someone else might have realized this future already now. So we should check our sky to see if there are any AI astronauts hovering near Earth. Because over a billion years, they could have populated the entire space in between stars. And we should not make the mistake made by philosophers four centuries ago when they declined to look through Galileo Galilei's telescope because they knew that the sun moves around the Earth. And they were wrong. Today, they would have canceled him on social media. Back then, they put him in house arrest, but that didn't change the trajectory of the Earth around the sun. And in fact, if you were to ask these philosophers to design a rocket, 
that will reach Mars, they will never get there because they thought that Mars moves around the Earth. So reality is whatever it is. And if we don't look through our windows and argue we are the smartest in our cosmic block, that will not get rid of our neighbors. And speaking about looking out, the first object from outside the solar system was discovered in 2017 by a telescope in Hawaii called PANSTARS. And this object was given the name Oumuamua, which means a scout in the Hawaiian language. Uh, we knew that it came from outside the solar system because it moves too fast to be bound to the sun. And it came from a very special frame of reference called the local standard of rest, which is the frame that you get to when you average over the random motions of all the stars in the vicinity of the sun. And this object was at rest in that frame. Only one in 500 stars is so much at rest in that frame. So it didn't come from any of the nearby stars. Um, it was sort of like a buoy sitting at rest on the surface of the ocean and the solar system like a giant ship bumped into it. A very unusual situation. And the sun gave it a kick through its gravitational force. Sort of like a rocket giving a kick to a ping pong ball. As the object was tumbling every eight hours, the amount of sunlight reflected from it changed by a factor of 10. That meant that the object has a very extreme shape, most likely flat, pancake-like, based on the variation of reflected light. And there were a number of unusual anomalies that this object exhibited, in addition to the ones that I mentioned. For example, uh, it deviated from a trajectory that is shaped just by the sun's gravity. There was an additional force pushing it away from the sun. But the object was not evaporating. It didn't look like a comet. There was no outgassing, no gas or dust seen near it the way you see uh, around comets. So the question was, what gave it this excess push. And the only thing I could think of was the reflection of sunlight. But for that to be effective, the object had to be very thin, just like a sail. And nature doesn't make sails. Uh, so the question is, what produced this object? Could it be artificial in origin, a product of a technological civilization? from outside the solar system. And that was a proposal that uh, I made in a scientific paper. Uh, but after that paper was published, there were a number of other proposals made by the mainstream of astronomy. And all of them contemplated something we've never seen before, like a chunk of frozen hydrogen or a chunk of frozen nitrogen. These are things we've never seen before. And the suggestion was maybe the object was made of materials that are unusual so that we don't see them when they evaporate. There was even a suggestion that maybe it's like a dust bunny, a cloud of dust particles um, that is very porous, a hundred times less dense than air. But we've never seen any of these. And the fundamental question is, is an Oumuamua an unusual rock of a type that we've never seen before, or an artificial or, uh, object that was manufactured by an advanced technological civilization? That is the fundamental question. And the way I think of it is that when you walk on the beach, most of the time you see rocks and seashells that were naturally produced. But every now and then you see a plastic bottle. And perhaps that was Oumuamua. There was another object discovered, this one in September 2020. So it was given the name 2020SO. 
And it also exhibited an excess push away from the sun by reflecting sunlight with no cometary tail. But a few weeks after this object was discovered by the same telescope in Hawaii, it was realized that in fact, this is a rocket booster that was launched by NASA in 1966 in a mission to the moon. So we know that this rocket booster had thin walls. That's why it's being pushed by reflecting sunlight. And we also know that it was not designed to be a sail and it was artificially produced. We produced it. The question is, who produced Oumuamua? And just imagine a cave dweller finding a cell phone. Initially, the cave dweller will argue this object is a rock of a type that we have never seen before. Just like my colleagues argued about Oumuamua. But if the cave dweller is curious, he might press a button and realize that it records his voice. And then he might understand that it's not a rock. So what we need is really better data, more evidence about the nature of objects like Oumuamua. And that's one of the primary objectives of the Galileo project that I established about half a year ago. Because if we bring a camera to the vicinity of a future object like Oumuamua, we could take a picture that will tell us whether it's a, a rock of a type that we've never seen before, or it has bolts and screws on it. And we can read off the label made on exoplanet Y because they say a picture is worth a thousand words. In my case, a picture is worth 66,000 words, the number of words in my book, Extraterrestrial. I wouldn't need to write the book if we had a megapixel image of Oumuamua. And we have such an image of uh, an actual rock uh, the asteroid Bennu, you can see it on the right-hand side, was taken by the mission OSIRIS-REx. And that mission landed on this asteroid. You can tell that it's a rock. And it picked some sample from there that it will bring back to Earth next year. Now, another thing that happened was uh, the Pentagon reported to Congress about unidentified aerial phenomena in June uh, 2021, last year, uh, there was a report submitted, and uh, it said that there are objects whose nature is unclear in the atmosphere of the Earth. And that means the scientific community needs to attend to these objects because the government doesn't know what they are. And so the Galileo project aims to figure out the nature of these objects as well by building new telescope systems. And we call it the Galileo project because we dare to look through new telescopes to find the answers. We don't want to repeat the mistake of those philosophers that refuse to look through the telescope for the answers. So there are two major branches of the Galileo project. One is to figure out the nature of unidentified aerial phenomena. And the second is to rendezvous with the next Oumuamua-like object. And what we aim to get is a high-resolution uh, image of any object whose nature is unclear. And that's just following the scientific method of being guided by evidence and not by prejudice, not assuming that we know the answer in advance. Now, Fermi, Enrico Fermi, a very famous physicist, asked 70 years ago, where is everybody? But this is just like a fisherman sitting on the beach and saying, where are all the fish? I don't see anything. Well, of course, you need to use a fishing net to find them. And that's what the Galileo project aims to do, to look through telescopes. The telescopes are our fishing nets. And 
you may think of this as archaeology in space to find artifacts of technological civilizations that are not around anymore. They may have sent packages that we find in our mailbox. And my hope is that by finding relics of more intelligent cultures, we would be inspired. Because the one thing I see throughout human history is that the worst things happen when a group of people tries to feel superior relative to another group of people. The best example is the Second World War, when the Nazi regime triggered the death of 75 million people just because it felt superior relative to other people. And that's, that was 3% of the world population back then, 10 times more than the number of deaths triggered by COVID-19 so far, just because some people decided to feel superior. But if we keep ourselves modest, if we find a smarter kid on our cosmic block, it will make the differences among humans insignificant unimportant, and maybe that would inspire us to treat each other as equal members of the human species. Thank you.